Now it's time to leave offer and acceptance and to venture into our review of what is for most law students the most abstract and difficult of all contracts topics. Consideration. As I think you'll remember from law school, for a contractual promise to be enforceable, that promise must normally be supported by consideration furnished by the other side. We'll discuss in a little while what consideration consists of, but let me start our coverage of this topic by making two general observations about the testing of consideration on the multi-state. The first comment is that the multi-state examiners love to test you on consideration. You can count on seeing at least two, probably three questions that turn on the presence or absence of consideration or on the fact that consideration is not needed. The second comment is that often, even though the correct solution turns on the presence or absence of consideration, the correct choice won't expressly mention consideration. The examiners will go out of their way to craft a correct answer that relies on consideration, but that doesn't mention that word, because the drafters don't want to tip you off that the correct answer is part of the doctrine of consideration. On the other hand, if there is no consideration problem, the wrong choice may very well explicitly mention lack of consideration because the examiners want to create an attractive red herring. As I said a moment ago, any contractual promise must be supported by consideration from the other side, except in those relatively unusual cases where some exception to the consideration requirement applies. This means that you have to know when a contractual promise is deemed to be supported by consideration. A promise will be supported by consideration from the other side only if two things are true. First, the promise must be given as part of a bargain. In other words, as part of an exchange rather than, say, a gift. And second, Either the promisor or a third party must receive in exchange for the promise some act, forbearance, or return promise. The second of these two requirements is relatively easy to meet for multi-state purposes as long as you can identify something that the promisee is doing or promising to do differently from what he was already obligated to do and that something is being given in return for the promisor's promise. The second requirement is met. In fact, both of the requirements I've just listed sound pretty easy to meet. The first requirement, that there be some sort of exchange, doesn't sound like it would be a problem very often. And the second requirement, that there be an act, forbearance, or return promise in exchange for the promise, also doesn't sound very demanding. So when will consideration matter on the multi-state? The answer is that most consideration problems on the multi-state involve some sort of promise to modify an existing contract, to settle an existing claim or to make partial payment of a pre-existing debt. In other words, where two parties are strangers and get together in some sort of deal from scratch, it's very unlikely that their initial deal will pose a consideration problem. Only where the parties somehow agree to modify or settle a pre-existing deal or claim is consideration likely to be an issue. Let's do Hypo 14. Uncle writes to nephew, quote, I know you like my Mercedes 350. It's got a market value of $50,000, but I'll sell it to you for $10,000 if you like. Assume that this is a correct statement about the car's market value. Nephew writes back, quote, I accept, unquote. Is uncle contractually obligated to sell the car to nephew for $10,000? The answer is, yes, uncle is bound to go through with the deal. Before I explain, I've got to make a small confession. I told you a few moments ago that practically the only time the consideration makes a difference on the multi-state is where the parties are somehow promising to modify or settle an existing claim or relationship. 
But that statement overlooked one other area, which I think you'll recall from law school as being your first exposure to the consideration doctrine. This one area has to do with promises to make a gift. If the promisor is not motivated primarily by a desire to get something in exchange, but is instead primarily motivated by a desire to make a gift to the promisee, then the promise will be deemed not to be supported by consideration. I'm sure you'll remember from law school the encapsulated form of this rule. Promises to make gifts are unenforceable for lack of consideration, unquote. However, because the multi-state examiners know that you will probably remember this rule, they will rarely give you a fact pattern that can be resolved simply by observing that the promisor's promise is a promise to make a gift and is thus unenforceable. The promise to make a gift issue will be more disguised. Let's go back to Hypo 14. You might contend that when uncle is promising to sell nephew a car worth $50,000 for a price of $10,000, uncle is really promising to make a gift of about $40,000 to nephew and that this promise should therefore be ruled unenforceable for lack of consideration. But that's not the rule. In general, if a transaction is a mixture of a bargain and a gift, the consideration requirement is deemed satisfied. And that's what happens in a discounted price scenario, where one party offers to sell an item at a large discount to market value, but there's still an element of bargain because the buyer is paying real value. The discount does not prevent the consideration requirement from being deemed satisfied. On the other hand, for the consideration requirement in this discounted price scenario to be satisfied, it cannot be the case that the payment or the recital of payment is a complete sham. So even a large discount won't block consideration but the presence of sham or completely nominal so-called consideration may indicate that in reality there is no bargain at all, in which case the promise will be unenforceable for lack of consideration. It's pretty easy to apply this principle to Hypo 14. The $10,000 that nephew is promising to pay for the car is real money. It may be a lot less than the fair market value, but it's not such a tiny amount that it would cause a court to conclude that what's happening here is a promise to make a pure gift rather than a promise to carry out a mixed bargain and gift. So uncle has exchanged his promise for nephew's promise of real payment. And nephew's return promise is enough to constitute consideration for uncle's promise to sell. That makes uncle's promise enforceable. On the other hand, if uncle were promising to sell nephew the $50,000 car for, say, $10, that sum is so ridiculously low that it would be strong circumstantial evidence that uncle wasn't really intending to make a bargain at all. And in that event, uncle's promise would be deemed unsupported by consideration and therefore unenforceable. All right, then, let's move on to Hypo 15 whom we'll refer to as O, and Garden, agree in writing that Garden will put sod into O's front, side, and rear yards for a total of $10,000. Soon after Garden begins the work, he asks O to raise the price by 20%. The reason Garden makes this request is that times are good, and some of Garden's other customers want to hire him at higher prices than the ones that are provided for in his contract with O and Garden has only so much capacity. O refuses to increase the price. However, O orally agrees that Garden can skip the side yard. As long as Garden does the front and rear yards, O agrees that Garden can collect from O the full $10,000 contract price without having done the side yard work at all. In reliance on this oral agreement, Garden puts the sod into the front and rear yards, but not the side yard and then asks for his $10,000. O, reneging on their oral arrangement, demands that Garden do the side yard work after all in order to collect the $10,000 fee. If Garden refuses to do the side yard work, has Garden breached? 